Well, welcome back to Grace Church on the Hill uh, at 9 o'clock at our Christian Education Hour, and I'm so delighted to have a daughter of this parish, the Reverend Maria P. Ling. Welcome. Thank you, Micah. It's good to have you back. It's good to be back. For those who are um, maybe not as familiar with you, where are you most Sundays? Uh, all Sundays so far. I've uh -huh. been at St. Elizabeth's in Mississauga, mm -hmm. uh, although it's uh, by Zoom. So I'm at home, Zooming with the others, uh, and we are all at St. Elizabeth's. Okay, yeah, and that's in Mississauga? Mississauga. Yeah. Very good. Well, it's, it's very nice to have you back here um, to talk about one more of God's riddles. Yes. I'm wondering if you would uh, maybe just introduce our parable for the week and then read it through for us. Sure. So the parable is of the prodigal son or the prodigal and his brother. And that's from Luke chapter uh, 15. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his eldest son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. I think one of the, the first things that I notice about this parable, this story, is the two stories that come right before it are sort of leading, preparing readers uh, mm. to hear it. 
Um, and we talked about last week the parable of the lost sheep, and then of course that's followed by the parable of the lost coin. Mm. Um, and here we have a lost son. Mm. But uh, it's, it's much more complicated than just a, a sheep or a coin. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. It is like a bigger story, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a bigger story because it's about family relationships. Uh, it's about the interplay of, of uh, you know, the father and son relationship, the brother's relationship with each other. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if that's part of what makes this such a memorable and appealing story mm -hmm. is, yeah. you know, I, maybe I've lost a $10 bill before. I've never lost a sheep, but <laughs> I definitely know what it's like to have that sibling rivalry and right. to feel some of the friction with my parents. So yeah. I wonder if that makes the story a little more relatable. Um, yeah, I think, I think also what's interesting, right? When, and I think we've both read Paula Gouda's book, The Parables. Um, Jesus doesn't talk a lot about family relationships and the stories about him has been about how he understands the family as bigger than the, just the biological family. So that's interesting that in this story, you know, it is about the biological relationships and then, um, you know, the, the tensions that come with it and, and yet the deep love of the father for both his sons. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think sometimes, maybe especially in the United States, you get this talk about family values mm. and uh, this emphasis on the nuclear family, but scripture is filled with so many stories of, you know, families that go wrong in every way possible, right? Right, right from the very start in Genesis. So, <laughs> Just uh, like our popular King David with his many children right. and, and the troubles they had, right? Yeah. yeah. And the jealousies and so on. Yeah. Well, maybe we should get into the story a little bit more and sure. um, talk about the characters. The, of course, there's the son, the father, and then the other son. Mm. Uh, maybe we should start with the son who's called Prodigal. Yeah. Um, how do you read him? You know, it, it brings me back to my youth when we heard this story a lot because it seemed as if the adults wanted us to not behave like the prodigal son or uh -huh. that if we did, then we should always, uh, you know, think about coming back to the father or to God and then, you know, God will welcome us and forgive us, you know, that sort of came up a lot. I think they were trying hard to evangelize us or keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, and so much emphasis is given to that younger brother. It was only years later that I learned to look at the older brother mm. and to see myself in the older brother. But, you know, I think people love that kind of story, right, about this, this brother, this reckless brother who would dare approach his father for his inheritance. It's quite, uh, it's quite bold, really. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because it, it, isn't it saying to the father, I wish you were dead, mm -hmm. because that's the only time you can get your inheritance when someone dies who has left something to you. Mm -hmm. and, and it ties in also with, to, to me later on when the father says, this son was dead, but he's, you know, and, and, and here is this father who says it twice, you know, he was dead but has now come back or he was lost and has returned. Right at the beginning, the son is saying to the father, you're dead to me, give me my share of the inheritance and I'm leaving. And that struck me when, mm. I, when I was reading this and looking at, at how, you know, sort of paying a bit more attention to, to the father's response at the end. Yeah, yeah that, that's an element that I haven't really thought about. Not only is the son saying to the father, you know, I wish you were dead, but the father at the end sees his son as, as good as dead. Yeah. And I guess it's true that in the story itself, the son is very close to dying just from... Yeah, um, starvation. Yeah, or starvation. Hungry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it, it's a story of redemption, which I think, you know, yeah. we all love stories of redemption, <laughs> and, and that's a, a certainly an element there, but... It does seem to end on sort of an ambiguous note with the, mm. the elder son. I wonder yeah. how you yeah. see that. Yeah, I, I suppose the sort of more common interpretation is, you know, it's, it's an open-ended ending, right? Like we don't know if the son decided he would join in or if he would remain in his resentment and anger. So, uh, you know, I suppose that also means we're challenged to think about our response. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when I think of my own sort of different seasons in life, you know, when, when, when I have allowed myself to um, sort of dwell on my, my anger and resentments, it's easy to be like the big brother and say, you know, you've, I've done this and I've been faithful and I've done all this and, you know, what kind of reward have you given me? Um, it's, it's very easy to sort of uh, count the costs in that way to be calculative. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also makes me think of other parables where uh, Jesus tells the story uh, of the, you know, the landowner who pays the workers at different, who had come to work for him at different times, right? Like the landowner said, you know, it, isn't it for me to decide who gets paid and how much and I'm the one who decides and it's about uh, you know, the grace of God rather than who's right and who's wrong, who worked longer and who worked a shorter time. So it, it, you know, the parables challenge me to always sort of try to see things from God's perspective mm. and not to make it about me because it's very easy, right? We're supposed to find ourselves in the parables, but then to see that, you know, beyond that is a bigger, uh, bigger person, a bigger, uh, you know, sort of story mm -hmm. beyond just either my sinfulness, my... Um, you know, disobedience or my resentment, you know, sort of like, yeah. or even my good work. You yeah. Know? yeah. That just makes me think of the, the younger son who, in some ways, can't even see his father when he's come to mm. apologize because he's so caught up in his own sense of unworthiness. Right. Yeah. And of course, the father says, oh, don't worry about that at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I think in some ways that's what brings together the two sons is their mm. inability to see their father as as something other than, you know, this person who can provide right. financially for them. And, and so they're both kind of dead to him in that sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and in that sense, both of them are lost, right? I yeah. mean, that's, that's some, what, some of what we've been reading. Like, you know, they're both, they're both lost because they, they can't see, um, yeah, beyond just their present situation. Mm -hmm. and how unfair the circumstances are or how unworthy I am. And, right. You know, that There's sort of no thing. element of grace right. for either of where, them. Where they're concerned, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I see you have a book there. Yes. I wonder if you'd uh, introduce us to that book. I'm sure some people are familiar with it. Yeah, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henri Nouwen. I was told there's a proper way to pronounce it, and we all like to say Henry Nouwen, mm -hmm. but he's, he's Dutch, so it's not pronounced the way we pronounce it. But... <laughs> Uh, it's a reflection um, of the story, but also on a painting uh, that is in St. Petersburg um, that uh, Rembrandt did. And it's a, it's a beautiful um, reflection um, and, and what Henry Nouwen himself um, sees of God and of himself. And he, he talks about it. I mean, it, I would recommend it. I'm in a reading group and we just started it. Uh, so when we haven't finished the book, you would think I've read through the book. I've read excerpts from the book, but not the whole book at one go. Uh, but it's a small book. It's something, um, you know, people may want to pick up. And I think it's in the library here. I think so. It should, it should be in yeah. the library. And there is a print, a small print. Uh, oh, yeah. very good, yeah. But it's, it's a huge painting from what I understand. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six characters in the painting. Mm -hmm. And not, they're not all visible. Um, but there, there's a lot um, that Nawan sees in this and, and uh, how he understands the different characters. And he explains it in this book. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I was reading it uh, a few months ago. And one thing that struck me was the way Nawan imagines himself as each of those characters. Mm. And, uh, I know in St. Ignatius's uh, exercises, that's kind of a way into scripture is to right. find yourself somewhere in the yeah. scene and yeah. uh, his ability just to see himself in the son and mm. in the father and in the other son and in some yeah. of the bystanders, I think. Um, yeah, the hidden, you know, the, is the hidden person the mother or a servant, you know, like you can't tell, mm -hmm. you know, he did say it could be a woman. That's also this, this thing, if I can, you know, sort of move away from, from this book, unless you want to say more about that. You know how when you read with feminists, 
um, biblical scholars, they said, what, where's the mother? Mm -hmm. What has she got to say about all this? You know, uh, but we won't go into that today. <laughs> no, that's an interesting point. I, uh, this male has never thought of that question, so <laughs> well, I feel enlightened. <laughs> well, you all can bring it uh, you know, into a different discussion another time. But often some of the stories don't include um, the, the mother or the wife, mm -hmm. or even if the woman had any opinion like, where's the mother would have felt the pain of her son um, leaving, you know, and, and she might have been pleading with the husband, who knows, right? Like, you know, go look for your son, send the servants out. Or the father might be saying, no, he's got to learn, you know, he's got to mm -hmm. grow up. And who knows the conversation that took place? And where is the mother in the celebration? Was, was that person in the background, hidden in the shadows, the mother? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so these are things... You know, I, I suppose it, it takes a mother to think about, you know, like, yeah, where would I be if I were in that story? You know, what's my response? Or how would I say to the older brother, you are right to be resentful and angry because you have been a good son and look at your younger brother. You know, some mothers will take that, mm -hmm. that position. Uh, and that's no help either, because she would be feeding his yeah. you know, anger. Not gracious either. No, and that's something to learn too, right? How we help each other, how we support each other or not. Mm -hmm. Because there are times when, when we may be in this uh, place of disobedience or wanting to, to run away from, from say, a God or a loved one, that some people feed that. Um, you know, the, the, the emotions and like, yeah, you know, you shouldn't be, um, you know, you shouldn't put up with this. You should get what is rightly yours and go enjoy yourselves. I mean, there are many ways to look at it. We're not talking about a situation where there is uh, domestic violence and those sort of things. But, um, you know, sometimes our, our best friends could turn out to be our worst enemies because they are encouraging us to uh, leave our rightful place yeah. and to, to you, know, uh, you know, some people say, well, they have to sow their wild oats, you know. You don't have to, to prove God's love for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be a prodigal just to That's be right. accepted by the Father. That's yeah. right. Yep. Well, I think that, that does bring up uh, an interesting point. Uh, Paula Gooder, as you mentioned, is a little bit suspicious of seeing the Father as mm. a God figure. Right. Um, first, I think because just by acquiescing to his son's demand, yeah. he would have been kind of going against mm. what Jewish custom right. um, was and probably wasn't the most prudent thing to give his son this inheritance. So she thinks that uh, Luke's point is how much more will God yes. come and accept us? And, right. um, yeah, I wonder what you think of, yeah. of God and the Father there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Paula not to, you know, sort of project uh, God onto the Father and say, well, this is, you know, because the Father is flawed uh, mm -hmm. in this story, right? He's not perfect. He, he, he does things which uh, it can be somewhat self-centered as well. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But he is a human father. Mm. And I think it's good to remember that. Um, but there are, of course characteristics or qualities that we can pick up and say, you know, that's the good in the Father. And I'm sure that has to do with, um, you know, God's working in him as well. But to, yeah, I think we need to be careful with a lot of the parables because there's that uh, tendency to easily put characters into, oh, this is God, this is, you know, so-and-so, and I can see... Right, make know, it an allegory right, instead of, yeah, right, yeah, something a little bit more... That's right, because I, I think God is beyond these categories as well, right? So, mm -hmm. But it gives us a glimpse of what is possible when we uh, allow God to work in our lives. Mm. I think that's, uh, to me, a key here. And in that sense, we represent... Uh, the manifestation of God's Spirit working and transforming mm. uh, each one of us, you know, that we can reflect these God-like, Christ-like qualities. One, one thing that comes to mind when you say that is just the end of the parable before mm. the other son has his dispute with the father, just that celebration. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that I didn't pay that much attention to until I read some other uh, people who'd read this parable, but just like in the two parables that precede it, the lost coin and the mm. lost sheep, it ends with this joyous right. 
celebration. Yeah. Yeah. They called yeah. their friends or, or whatever. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I think earlier it connects it with the angels rejoicing at mm. someone's repentance yeah. with um, the lost sheep. But uh, yeah, that sense of excessive okay. celebration, sort of, you know, the partying being out of all proportion with right. what right. Um, brought it on. I think I see that kind of being a reflection of God's, um, God's embrace of us. And, and God's lavish prodigal love for us, right? Because mm-hmm. the word prodigal can also be applied to God, right? The reckless love, the lavish love of God. I remember um, a book I read years ago by Tony Campolo, uh, and it's, it's titled, uh, God's Kingdom is Like a Party, you know, and, and it, it sort of stuck with me. I, the book has a lot of stories about prodigals who return to God, and, you know, that's sort of uh, how, God, how God's kingdom is about celebrating these, uh, these good stories of people returning to mm-hmm. the Father or returning to God. And it is a party because, you know, of course we say some Christians need to uh, look less dour and, you know, sort of, but of course it doesn't mean we're happy, clappy people only, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we don't give in to just our moods, but um, there is um, that, that quality of, uh, you know, God's exuberance in, in celebrating the return of even one mm-hmm person or one lost sheep or one prodigal son, you know, just the one. So there's that, the individual and then there's the corporate. There's, there's always the balance between the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of my hopes as we transition out of this season is mm. that we'll have just more occasions to gather together and celebrate. Right. And, and the return, can, it would be a good excuse or good reason to have celebrations, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not that those preclude a time of mourning and lament no, for what's right, been lost, but right. uh, yeah, a sense of really in festivity and in sharing food together, we are kind of imitating what, uh, what Jesus says God is like. Yeah, yeah. Do we have a bit more time? I or think we have we... a little bit more time. Yeah. I'm wondering if I could, uh, just as you reflect on this parable, uh, I'm wondering if I could ask, how it's changed for you over the years. I assume you've been familiar with it for a long time. Yeah, uh, you know, like I said, when I was a, a teenager, a youth, it was always used to, you know, like behave yourselves, don't go out and, mm-hmm. you know, sort of do this. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I was rereading this in more recent times has been this idea of the father running out uh, to greet his son or to welcome his son. This idea of running seems to appear a lot in the scriptures, in the different stories, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, um, the resurrection story also had the disciples running hmm. either to the tomb or from the tomb. Uh, you know, Old Testament stories as well, a lot of running, you know, the servant ran, the prophet ran. Um, this idea of running, uh, not that I'm promoting that we all have to go out and run a marathon, <laughs> But I think, you know, the, the eagerness, and it, I, to me it ties in with the celebration, right? The, the eagerness to run, either to share news, uh, or to do something, or to celebrate, you know, a wonderful thing that happens. Um, I realize also over the years, there are times when I've become a lot more subdued in my expression. Uh, but this idea of running, uh, when there is something wonderful to encounter, Um, speaks to me of my own um, uh, excitement about things that I might have gotten jaded about over and, and, Mm. you know, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's nothing new. But it's always new, it's always fresh. Uh, And this story is, is, it's timeless. Uh, There are many ways, of course, um, over the years I've looked at it and and more recently is um, the, the reading, of course, of Henry Nouwen's book, but also this idea that we have to be like the father. Mm. Um, we can see ourselves in the prodigal son, we can see ourselves in the uh, older brother, but do we see ourselves in the father flawed and you know, making mistakes, but can we see ourselves in the father re- ready to embrace, mm. ready to welcome, ready to forgive, re- ready to celebrate, even when the person 
had done a great hurt to us. Mm. Um, I think, especially during these times when there's so much going on, you know, with with uh, with racism, um, with uh, the present situation of finding the unmarked graves of the indigenous children, um, you know, political situations and country, all kinds, it, even individuals during this year and a half of, of you know, very tense living, um, you know, this this embrace that we have also missed mm. in, in a real physical way, the, the hugs. Um, you know, I think we need to open not just our arms, but our hearts mm. to be like the father and say, you know, don't talk about what bad you've done to me. Let's talk about the fact that you are now alive and you are back home and I love you and welcome you. I, I think for me that's, you know, it's, it's a change from when I was a young person and always being told, don't be naughty, you know, you don't want to be like the prodigal son to say, you know, be like the father and then be ready and willing to accept those that, you know, maybe the rest of the people might not be comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a wonderful word for the present moment. There, mm. there seems like there's on the one hand, a really healthy recognition of sin in the past and mm. the ways that racial sin has continued to reverberate into the present. And on the other hand, it seems very difficult to have a sense of public penitence mm. and uh, public forgiveness. Mm. Um, and you know that the title of Desmond Tutu's book, No Future Without Forgiveness, right. I think, yeah. Um, yeah, points to, to, to what you challenged us to do um, in imitating the Father, to, to look to ways um, to embrace. I, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the time when we can actually hug again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, the soul is hungry for that, too. Yeah. You know, you, you can, I can feel it. The, the soul is hungry. And, you know, I, when, when I was here at Grace Church, there were always parishioners who were like, you know, exchanging a hug was like the highlight of the Sunday here mm. and, and then not being able to uh, and leaving, you know, for me, leaving at a time in the middle of the pandemic and not to be able to say, well, to say uh, bye, but without the hug it has also been, you know, uh, you know, there's that, that uh, hole in the, in the heart, so to speak, you know, where a hug would, would just fill it up again. Mm -hmm. know, yeah, and the father's embrace, like the, like the, like Rembrandt's painting, you know, the father's embrace would, would uh, sort of meet that need. Yeah, the tenderness of <laughs> yeah, that. The deep needs we have in our hearts. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to finish our conversation. Thank you, Maria. Oh, my pleasure. It's good to be back here and spend this time with you, Micah. Yeah, it's, it's been very good for me too. Well, this is our last of the four-week series on God's riddles, exploring the parables of Jesus. Look forward next week to an in-person gathering outside. We'll have coffee and uh, discussion of the lectionary text for the day. Um, and if you need more information about that, you can email me. But God's peace. That's wonderful. In person next yeah. week. <laughs> Good. You can come too. <laughs> yes. Mm. <laughs>